No intro today, let's just get right into it. Now in this tutorial, we're going to be learning how to use controller support in GDevelop. Now in many other game engines, controller support can be slightly more complicated, but in GDevelop, controller support is actually one of the simplest topics that you can have. But there are a few things that are good to know when dealing with controller support. Now, in order to even access controller support, natively GDevelop cannot access controllers by itself. So in order for us to access controllers, we have to use extensions. Now in order to install this extension, this is built in like naturally as a selection here in GDevelop. So go to the project manager in the top left corner, go to create or search for new extensions. And I'm going to type in gamepad. It was already typed up. I had just typed it up before and gamepads and it has parentheses controller. And you can see it gives us access to all of these that are under the bullet points. And we're going to be going over all of these except for maybe the dead zones. Dead zones are not too useful, especially for my testing, but we may go over that. But we also will not be going over the automatic mappers because we want to know how to program these controls ourselves, not automatically. So you want to install this into the project, and you'll know that's installed into the project when you see it on the side of extensions. Now, of course, we need something that we can control, so we need to have a player character. And of course, one of the best players you can control is a platformer. So I'm going to quickly create a platformer character. So I'm going to add a new object, add a sprite, name it player, and add a new animation. And when I add the sprite, I'm going to already, I have a sprite selected already, a 32 by 32 cube. And of course, you can easily go to Pisco and edit it yourself and create it yourself. It doesn't take long. I'm going to go to behaviors, add a behavior, and I'm going to have this as a platformer character. Now you want to turn off default controls. This is make sure we can't control it using the control pad and just letting you all know that I'm not using control pad. The controller actually works. Um, and I'm going to set the acceleration as really high. You don't have to change this if you don't like to, but I do like to set the acceleration and deceleration really high so it can have a snappy feel. So I'm going to apply this and I'm going to drag this onto the scene. And then the last object we want to add for now is a ground object. So I'm going to add another object as Sprite. And then I'm going to go into, I'm going to call it ground, add a new animation, add a sprite, and I'm going to have this one as a black cube instead. And for this one, go to behaviors first, and then add a behavior, and then add a platform. And make sure the ledges can't be grabbed, because we don't want our platform character to be able to grab ledges. And now we have a platform. And we want to drag this onto the scene, and I'm going to stretch it out horizontally, so it covers the whole scene. And I'm going to just have the player drop down. I'm going to preview this now. And as you can see, the player just simply drops on the floor and doesn't go through it. So everything is working fine right now. Now, how do we actually control the player? Now, the first thing we need to do, and the most common functionality when it comes to controllers, is being able to move using the control stick. Most players who play your game, they will be using control stick. That's what most people are comfortable with. So we want to learn how to access that. Now, it's very easy. You want to add a condition first. Go to other conditions and scroll down until you see the game paths and controllers. Now you see all of these options and you want to go to where it says gamepad stick is pushed. Now you'll see our first thing that we need to fill out is you see the gamepad identifier. Now the gamepad identifier is basically means the same thing as the player. And what I mean by this, you have player one, player two, player three, and player four. So just to get deeper into this, if I were to plug in a controller, it will automatically have a gamepad identifier of one. And while that controller is plugged in, if I plug in another controller while it's plugged in, the second controller will have a gamepad identifier of two, so on and so forth. If I unplug a controller um, and then plug it back in, it will still have it will have the gamepad identifier of one. But since we'll only have one controller right now, of course, we're going to use one. And then you see stick left and right. Of course, modern controllers nowadays have two control sticks. And of course, we want to ask that the left stick that's most commonly used for moving. And then you have the direction. You have up, down, left, right, and then any direction. And of course, in this case, we want to start by using left. We want it so we can move left. So I'm going to hit OK, add an action, go to other actions. Well, not other actions. I'm going to go to the player. And then we want to simulate a left key press. Basically, this is doing the same thing as if we were to press left on the keyboard. So I'm going to hit OK. Now, before you start testing, of course, you need a controller with, with you. Now, the best way to test it, you could use Bluetooth, but sometimes it doesn't always connect well. Most controllers have a wired connection, so you can just plug it up using a USB. In my case, I'm using a Nintendo Switch controller, and we'll get more into that later, the controller that supports. But I'm going to just plug this into my computer at the moment, and I'm going to start using it. So now I preview, and if you have a controller with you, you should be testing this. But if I press left on my control stick, 
it now moves to the left. And you can do the same thing for all the other directions. In this case, I'm going to just copy and paste it once. And instead of moving left, we want to go right. So we want to put if the direction is pressed in the right direction. Instead of simulating left key press, you want to simulate the right key press. So I'm going to once again test this. And you should see that you should be able to move left and right using the control stick. Now, how about accessing buttons? That's also something very common. We have to be able to access button presses. And this is also extremely easy. Go to add conditions, other conditions. You can go to game pass, scroll down where it says game pass, and then game pad button press. You also have game pad button release, but normally when you're playing a game, the moment you press the button, that's when an action occurs, not when you release it. But if you do want to do releasing, you can do that. Of course, gamepad identifier is one. Now, a few things to know. You see that we have Xbox, PS4 controller, and then we have other. Now, the way that this works, the way from my testing and from what the extension says, it supports Xbox controllers. This extension supports PS4 controllers, and it supports PS3 controllers. But it also, even though it doesn't say so, it does support Nintendo Switch controllers, but it treats Nintendo Switch controllers like Xbox controllers. So if you're using a Nintendo Switch controller, make sure to treat it like an Xbox controller and not treat it like a PS4 controller or it won't work. Now, gamepad identifier, of course, is one. And the name of the button, since I'm using Nintendo Switch, I want the jump button to be A on my Nintendo Switch controller. But since, once again, it's treating it like an Xbox controller, the A and B position are swapped on Xbox and Nintendo Switch. So since I want to use A to jump for my Nintendo Switch controller, I'll actually put B for the Xbox controller. And I'm going to hit OK. And when B is pressed, I'm going to add an action going to player. And now I want to put simulate the jump key press. And now I'm going to hit OK and preview this. Now, if I press A, you should jump. You should jump if you press A. And everything is working fine right now. Now, I want to show you something. You can't get it mixed up with PlayStation. Because I can see the PS4 and PlayStation controller, they have cross, which is the X. You have the square, you have the circle, you have the triangle, and all of these other buttons. If I try to put cross, let's say I try to put cross um, at the jump button here, which is the X on PlayStation. If I preview this and I try to use A to jump, it actually still treats it. Uh, even when you're using Nintendo Switch, the way it has it mapped out, it'll still treat it like I'm pressing B because that's where the cross is located. It's in the same position as the B key or the B button on Nintendo Switch controller. So technically, you don't even have to match it but it's just better to have it you know making more sense in your code so that's how you do button presses in terms of gameplay now you can also i'm going to go over these conditions i'm not going to actually create anything for them but i'm just showing you that you can also when you're accessing these gamepad buttons the other where it says up down left and right this is talking about the control pad or what people call the d-pad and so if you want to access that control pad which a lot of players do use the control pad especially hardcore players, you want to use up, down, left, and right. You also see you have click stick left and click stick right. And that's because many controllers you can click, especially almost all modern controllers, you can click the control stick and that can be used for extra functionality for your game. Now, now that we're done with that part, let's go over vibration. Because of course, controller vibration makes your game much more dynamic and much more was to work for much more immersive, I'll say, when you have rumble in your game. Now I'm going to start off by adding an action here in the always condition. I'm going to other actions and going to gamepad and controller. Now you'll see that we have advanced gamepad vibration, change the gamepad's active vibration, set gamepad dead zones, and then gamepad vibration. Now we're starting off with this gamepad vibration. This is a simple vibration. You can't really change much with this vibration. It's just very simple. Now, of course, the gamepad identifier, once again, is one. And then the time of the vibration, this controls um, how how long it's going to vibrate when it starts up. And But since this is an always condition, it will vibrate forever anyway. But I'm going to just put... I'm going to put 0 0.5 seconds. It really doesn't matter what you put here since it's an always condition. I'm going to preview. Now, right now, I don't feel anything in my controller vibrating at all. So let me make sure everything's working right. Maybe it didn't um, it didn't register. So that's why you, ha you have to press a control stick 
you have to press a button on your controller for it to vibrate. Now, of course, you can't really hear it. It's not a strong vibration, but my controller is vibrating right now. So if you're using a controller, you should feel vibration. Of course, this won't work if your controller doesn't have vibration. Now, that's a simple vibration. You don't want, want to always have a weak vibration. So how do you add a stronger vibration? In order to add a stronger vibration, you go to the advanced gamepad vibration. Of course, you see, once again, this gamepad identifier. How long do you want to vibrate? And of course, for a strong vibration, you would probably use something like one second. And you'll see that we have strong rumble magnitude and the weak rumble magnitude. Because that's because the controllers, they have like a weak rumble setting and they have a strong rumble setting. So, of course, it goes up from zero to one. Now, when it goes up from zero to one, it doesn't mean that there's only two values. It's not binary. There's still an infinite number of values between zero and one. You could have 0 0.9, you could have 0 0.99, you could have 0 0.009988, something like that. There's still an infinite amount of values that can go between zero and one. So don't think you're limited by this just because the magnitude is only zero and one. So I'm going to set the strong rumble magnitude as one. And I'm also going to set, I'm going to set the weak rumble magnitude as zero and see what happens and see how this feels. You can test out different vibrations. Now, you may be able to hear this on my mic. I'm not sure. I'm putting it close to the mic just in case. But right now my controller is vibrating very strongly. Now, if some controllers have stronger vibrations than others, but this is a very strong vibration. So if you ever want to make a feature in your game where you want the player to feel a lot of impact, you want to use a strong vibration. Now I'm going to set the weak rumble vibration as one as well and see what happens. And that makes the vibration even stronger when they're both set to one. So basically, if you want your rumble to be as strong as possible, you want to set both of these to one because your controller has a strong rumble and then it has a weak rumble. So I'm going to stop right here for this um, vibration. Now, there's a few more things you can do with controller support. There are a few more things you can do. Now, I'm not going to make an event for this. Once again, a lot of these have to be explained. Now, this is to check if a gamepad is connected. Now, I am going to use this um, later, but this is check if a gamepad is connected. In order for us to actually use this, let's program two-player controls because you may be wondering, how do you actually have several people controlling something when you're doing controller support? Now, first of all, I'm going to ha create a new player. I'm actually going to duplicate this player. I'm going to right-click player and duplicate it. And it's going to be called player two. And just so it looks different, I'm going to add a sprite and use the blue cube so we can tell the difference between the two. I'm going to delete this old frame and hit apply. Now, what we want to do is, the first thing we want to do is detect that when the gamepad is connected, when a second controller is connected, we want it so the, the player spawns when a second controller is connected. So I'm going to add condition, go to other conditions, and then I'm going to go to gamepads and check if a gamepad is connected. Now, once again, remember what I said about Gamepad identifier 1, 2, and 3, 4. We're trying to check if the second player is connected. So we want to check if gamepad identifier 2 is connected. And I want to set this as a trigger 1 event because we're about to spawn the player. Because we don't set this as trigger once, the player will keep keep spawning. And eventually the game will lag out and eventually even crash because of an infinite amount of players spawning. So after we do this, we want to spawn a player. So we want to click into player 2, create an object. I'm going to create the object at the origin, and of course the origin is 0, 0 on the X and Y, and hit apply. Now, if you have a second controller, you can go get it right now and plug it up. But if you don't have a second controller, um, you'll have to follow along. But this does work. I have two controllers with me. Now I'm going to unplug my mouse so I can actually tell that's happening. And right now you'll see that there's no second player because I haven't connected my second controller. I'm about to connect my second controller in 3, 2, one and it's connected and you'll see that started and i got didn't use my vibration yet but well, i didn't stop my vibration but now you see that there's a second player on the scene but of course we can't control this second player so how do we actually control the second player in order for us to control the second player it's the same code that we're using for if the same code that we're using at the top up here so i'm going to duplicate both of this code i'm going to copy and paste it paste it again and we can keep the same code I'm going to set this instead of simulating right let's we'll set this direction as left and instead of simulating the right key press we want this to simulate the left key press 
and instead of gamepad identifier one, that controls the first player. So now you want to put gamepad identifier two. Gamepad identifier two. And now that when I play, instead of simulating the one th more, one more thing before we leave, instead of simulating the right key press for player, you gotta make sure it's player two, because if it's not player two, it's not gonna work. So I'm going to click into this player two, and then preview this. And I still have my vibration on, so. But I'm going to use my second controller. If you have a second controller, once again, test this. But now I can move left and right with my second controller as well. I can move left and right. Now, there's a few more things that we need to cover. Not that much. I'm going to unplug this second controller so I can use my mouse again. But I'm going to delete this vibration. There's a few more things you can do. Now, you can use stick force. Now, stick force, what is stick force? I'm going to, first of all, add a new event and go to a condition, go to other conditions, and I'm going to talk about the stick force. Now, stick force is exactly what it sounds like. It's how hard you're pressing on the stick. Because as you know, a control stick is not linear like a button. It's analog, which means it's not just two values that go in between each other. There's a bunch of values that can go in between two max values. Now, let's say you see the stick pad, the, well, not stick pad, the game pad stick force, it can go from zero to one. So basically, if you think about you, if you fully press your stick in a direction, no matter what direction it is, the stick force is going to be equal to one. When your stick is in the neutral position, when you're not touching it at all, the stick force is equal to zero. And if you're halfway, like if you're slightly moving your stick, it hasn't completely reached the side um, of the control stick limits yet. It's a value in between zero and one. So let's say we want to make sure we want to check if our stick force is greater than 0 0.5 because that'll be halfway and we're trying to see if this is on the first player controller and instead of using the left stick let's just use the right stick just to show that works and once again modern controllers have two control sticks so if we if the right stick force is greater than 0 0.5 just to let us know that something happened I'm just going to activate a, a simple vibration I'm going to activate a simple vibration I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to hit Preview. Now, if you have your controller, make sure you test this. But if you slightly press your stick, you'll see that nothing happens. But if I even over halfway, the moment I go over halfway with my stick force, it starts vibrating. And that's what you're supposed to, that's how it's supposed to be. Once again, if your controller is not vibrating, make sure to either check your code or make sure that your controller has vibration in the first place. So that's how you do it, stick force. So let me see if there's any more conditions. You also have dead zones. You have controller dead zones. And these are like actions. You can access these controllers dead zones with actions. Now you can set the gamepad dead zones for sticks. Um, and the dead zone is when movement will not be taken into account. So let's say the dead zone for sticks default is like 0 0.2. So basically, unless you move your control stick over 0 0.2, um, it will not be considered as moved yet. So you have to move your controller at least a little bit. So I'm going to see. I'm going to go into this um, action. I'm going to set my gamepad dead zone as always equal to. Let me go into gamepad controller. Set gamepad dead zone. And I'm going to set it as 1 for the gamepad identifier. And then the dead zone is also 1. So I'm going to preview. And if you see, if you right now, you can't even move at all. And that's because we set it so the dead zone, it has to be over one. But of course, a control stick can never go over one in terms of its value. So basically, if you want to make the player like actually have to press the control stick more, you can set a z dead zone for the movement. Because sometimes people don't like really loose type gameplay. Most time people do like it. So that's why I wasn't really too worried about the dead zone. But just in case you do want to set a setting like this in your game, you can add it using dead zones. And let me see if I missed anything else. I've already went over all these things, except for this. You also have gamepad type, because everything else is ba basically self-explanatory. We've already did stuff like that. And the gamepad type, this is just useful for displaying specific things, like in terms of UI, depending on what controller is connected. Like for example, you could set it so if you have a gamepad, if you have a gamepad that's an Xbox controller, you can make the UI look like it's xbox like you can have button presses that match that ui of an xbox controller same thing it supports ps4 it can detect steam controllers 
PS3 controllers. And it also says among other. It's not specific on those. But just in concept, you can make it so it can detect what type of controller is connected so you can change things in your game accordingly. So like I said, once again, also very self-explanatory. Now, before we drop off this tutorial, one more thing I want to add is a warning with third-party controllers. What I mean by third-party controllers are like non-officially licensed controllers and even sometimes officially licensed controllers um, that are third-party and not regular controllers. Sometimes they can work in a weird way, just like I have a third-party controller as my second player and the buttons just don't even work when I try to program them in my second player controller. So third-party controllers work a little bit differently. I'm not saying that for all third-party controllers, but the way they're programming is it doesn't mix well with this extension sometimes. So if you do have some weird problems, it may be because you may be using a third-party controller and you may want to get an official controller. But that's the only thing that's a problem with third-party controllers. But that's the end of this controller support tutorial. If you enjoyed this tutorial, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like the video, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on any of my new tutorials. Make sure to comment down below which tutorials you would like to see next, what tutorial series you would like to see next, what you would like to see me cover on this channel. And also, before I leave, I would like to once again thank all my followers for 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. I wasn't expecting to get here this far this fast but with the help of all my subscribers all of you um we reached it quite fast i want to thank all my subscribers for that thank all my subscribers for that and all my followers and we're going to keep growing in the future but once again i want to thank all of you viewers for watching and i'll catch you in the next tutorial see ya